In Jesus' name we pray. Our God and our Father, we bless your name for reminding us that Jesus is coming again. He'll come unannounced, and there will be many people in this world that will not be ready. Because they will come in a twinkling of an eye, suddenly, and the church is taken away. We pray, O Lord, you help every one of us to be wise, to prepare for that day, so that whenever it will be, morning, noon, or night, we'll be ready to go with the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that you help us not to just come here to play religion, but to serve you in truth, in spirit, with honesty and faithfulness. So that on the day in the time when the Lord will come, every one of us will be ready to go with the Lord in Jesus' name. We want to go through a series of studies where you yourself, Lord, spoke about your coming again. And we know that your thoughts are very deep. Therefore, we are asking you, Lord, that you will assist us as we go into the scriptures, that in this series, you open our eyes of understanding so that we'll see what you have for us in your word in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that we will not be asleep. We'll be awake. And we pray that you grant us a spirit of prayer and supplication so that as we listen to your word, we'll be able to pray the kind of prayer you want us to pray and will be ready for the coming of the Lord. Teach us at this time, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. In this uh, year's Congress, our Bible teaching series will be from Matthew chapter 24. And as you look at the program page, you will see that there are four studies covering Matthew chapter 24. And it's the first study we're looking at today. The whole chapter has been divided into four parts. Of course, you know that Jesus gave everything at a stretch. In fact, this is the longest answer that he gave to any single question in the New Testament. You may also discover that as you read throughout your Bible, this will be the longest answer in the whole Bible to a single question. If Jesus will take so much time giving us such a lengthy answer about his coming again, it must be very important. Actually, the answer he gave to the question you'll find in both chapters 24 and 25. But we only have time in a series at this time to cover chapter 24. And the first study, which is the one we're having now, is titled, Signs of Christ's Second Coming. The next study is the Great Tribulation and Christ's second coming. And the one following after that, the imminence of Christ's return. And the one that concludes our series of studies, readiness for Christ's return. We will not read the whole chapter today. We'll just read the verses related to the part we're covering today. Open your Bible with me, please. Matthew chapter 24 from verse 1, all through to verse 14. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily, certainly and truly. Without any shadow of doubt, I'm telling you, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, 
the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, why shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world, the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, beware, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness <clears throat> unto all nations. And then shall the end come. That's the part we're studying today. Signs of Christ's second coming. These verses I've just read to you. They form the important beginning of a large portion of unfulfilled prophecy. You may know as a student of the Bible that much of the Bible is prophecy. And many of the prophecies have been fulfilled. And yet many in the area of the coming of the Lord are still to be fulfilled. This chapter that we're approaching in study now ought to be approached with an earnest prayer for the teaching of the Spirit. We say that because you should know that it's not everything Jesus said that was clear to everybody. Even the simple parables were not always clear to the Pharisees. And to the Sadducees, in fact, even the disciples of Jesus Christ many times will say, Tell us, what do you mean by that? What do you signify by, by what you have just said? And so as we read the deep prophecies or concerning the second coming of the Lord, you must understand there could be many, many of us or many in the church at large that do not understand or have not understood what Christ was really driving at. And so to understand this chapter in particular, we must keep in mind the question that gave rise to the Lord's discourse, which is referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Look at the question again in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, tell us your disciples, Tell us who have left everything and we are following you. Tell us to whom you have given those parables and you explained everything to us. You have said some things of late we do not understand. Tell us. You have been talking about you abandoning the temple. You have been talking about leaving the house of Israel desolate and ruined. You have been talking about the destruction of the temple. And that not, not one stone will be left upon the other. Can you tell us when shall these things be? And that's not the end of the question. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? You've told us over and over and over that you are coming again. You are coming again. And we believe you are coming again. Can you tell us the unmistakable indicator, the sign? 
the things we will see around us in our world that will make us to know that your coming is imminent. And then you have also spoken about the end of the world. Can you tell us what shall be the end, the signs of the end of the world? Basically, that's the question they asked. And then he gave them an answer. I want you to know that this was the very last week of Jesus' earthly ministry before he went to the cross to die for our sins. Actually, he had been to the temple. And if you have read Matthew very well, you'll see that in a few chapters preceding chapter 24, he had cleansed the temple. And then the Pharisees had said, when he cleansed the temple, what authority do you have? Can you show us the authority you have? And then he gave them in answer parables. Not only that, he began to rebuke the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And chapter 23 is uh, containing the woes and the wrath of God and the judgment he, he brought upon them. He concluded that chapter. But chapter 23, by these words, very terrible, fearful words for the children of Israel. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets, and stoned the, them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. They had rejected him, their king, their messiah, their savior. The divine propitiation that he was going to make for them, they had rejected everything he had to offer. And then he said, I would have gathered you up. I would have saved you. I would have given you not only spiritual security, but national security. But you have rejected everything. Then he said in verse 38, Behold your house. Can you notice the change of language? Because when he was cleansing the temple, he said, You have turned my father's house into a den of robbers. But now, at the time, he was going to abandon Israel and leave them to their ruin and leave them to their unbelief. He didn't say, This is not my father's house. He said, Behold your house. You have not allowed God. You have not allowed the Messiah. You have not allowed the anointed one Christ to rule over you. It's now your house. I've left it unto you desolate. In the Greek, that means waste. It means abandoned to ruin. And then he said in verse 39, For I say unto you, that ye shall not see me henceforth. But that's not the end of the sentence. Until you, shall, you will say. Till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of of the Lord. By the way, do you know that what I've just read now, the last part of verse 39, is a messianic title. That means the children of Israel looking for the Messiah, they refer to him as he that shall come in the name of the Lord. And then he was saying, at present you have rejected. Uh, they, they, they almost got near to accepting because you see, he rode into the city. And when he rode into the city, the children were crying aloud and they were rejoicing. And they used exactly that same title of the Messiah in Matthew chapter 21, verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. The multitude, they were crying. It appears they were going to recognize that this is the one. The one that cometh in the name of the Lord. But eventually their leaders rejected the Messiah. And so he said, you are rejected. Your house is left unto you desolate. You will not see me again. You don't want me. You will not see me again until that generation that will say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That was his last statement in public. To the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, to the people in the temple. You find in chapter 24 verse 1, And Jesus went out. That's the, that's the thing that follows, um, reject, You have rejected me, your house is left unto you desolate. That's the thing that follows, You ye shall not see me henceforth. 
until that time when you will cry aloud and say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jesus went out and he departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, do you understand that those disciples of Jesus Christ were village people. They were rural people. And these uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, simple fishermen and simple illiterate people, they had never seen anything like this before. This is a temple built by Herod. He was an Idumean. That is, he came from Idumea. And it was a marvelous temple. Historians tell us that uh, the building of the temple also had other buildings around. It was so fascinating. In fact, an historian of that time said, if you have not seen Herod's temple, you have never seen a good, beautiful, wonderful building. And so these uh, disciples, like villagers, never seen something like this before. After he said, your house is left unto you desolate. And then uh, they said to him, Jesus, look at this. Isn't this marvelous? And that brought another word from the Lord in verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things, all the stones, all the gold, and everything you can see that the temple is made of? He said, There shall not be left here one stone upon the other that shall not be thrown down. And it was unbelievable. Because historians tell us that some of the stones were 80 feet long, 20 feet wide, and um, also 20 feet high. That is, it's like very, very heavy thing. And they carried and queried that thing, and they brought everything, and they just laid them down. And they had 1,000 priests working on them to build the temple area, and had 10,000 other trained workers building the other parts. And when it was finished, they started um, about uh, 20 BC and finished uh, the preliminary stage at uh, 10 BC. And it went on till AD 64 before they actually finished everything. It took them so many years, about 84 years, to be able to finish that marvelous temple. And then Jesus said, that temple that had taken so long to build, and everything had been put together, he was telling them that no stone will be left on, uh, upon the other. If it was very difficult for the disciples to even see that these things will be raised up, it was more difficult for them to know that it's going to be torn down. And so, when Jesus told them that, oh, they had another question. They went now, Jesus took them to the Mount of Olives. And those who have been to Israel, they tell us that when you get to the Mount of Olives, on the other side, the opposite side, you will see the beautiful temple, especially when the sun is setting. And you see the rays of light and the grandeur and the beauty and the majesty of that building. And so Jesus now, as he sat down, and those disciples were still thinking, remember once again, these are people from rural areas. These, are, these were villagers, and they, they were thinking of the marvels, the wonder of that temple. And Jesus said, it's going to come down. And so they wanted to know how this thing can be. Then in verse 3, as they sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, you, you must tell us this one. Tell us, when shall these things be? What are those things? That is the temple that is already discarded, abandoned, left to ruin, left to be desolate, and is going to be torn down and destroyed. When shall that be? That's the first question. Then number two, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Why were they asking about the coming? Look at verse 39. He said in verse 39 of uh, chapter 23, For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh. Which indicates that Jesus will be coming again. And they understood that. But they wanted to know, you said, Ye shall not see me till there's a time interval. You are telling us that although you are abandoning Israel now, you are forsaking Israel now, you are leaving them to their ruin and desolation, but you are saying you are coming again. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So they wanted to know, to be ready and well prepared, what will be the sign of thy coming? They had a thought question. 
the end, the sign of the end of the world. You say, why will they ever think of the end of the world? Well, because uh, other times Jesus had mentioned the end of the world. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 39 and verse 40. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world. So Jesus had told them the world will end. The present age, the age of sin, the age when Satan and sin and evil people have been ruling and dominating, that age will end in verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Once again, Jesus, the second time, mentioned the end of the world. Verse 49, that same chapter. So shall it be at the end of the world. So you see, three times over in that single chapter, Jesus Christ had referred to the world coming to an end. So then they wanted to know three things. Number one, they wanted to know when shall these things be? The destruction of the temple. Number two, you are coming again as a king, the reigning king, and the Messiah. When is it you will come? And what will be the signs preceding your coming? Number three, what will be the signs indicating the end of the world? And it's that, that's the question that brought Jesus Christ uh, to the answer that he gave unto them. And as we look at the answer that he gave to them, the signs we're looking at today. That is, we're looking at uh, just verses 1 to, um, 1 to 14. And in these verses 1 to 14, I see six signs that he gave his disciples. Number one, deception. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Number one, deception. Number two, dissensions. Dissensions, that means the disputes that will be international. Nation against nation, kingdom against nation, people against people. He told them in verses 6 and 7, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Must come to pass. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Number three, devastation. The latter part of verse seven. And there shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are just the beginning of sorrows, devastations. The whole world will be devastated. And then number four, destruction of life. Because it said in verses 9 and 10, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Number five, deflection. Deflection. That means the people going away from the Lord. That means people denying the Lord, deflecting, deflection, deflection from Christ. Because they said, and many false prophets shall arise, and they will deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Number six, declaration of the gospel worldwide. Declaration. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. In all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And so Jesus Christ gave them these six signs. Deception. Dissensions. Devastation. Destruction of life. Deflection from Christ. Declaration of the gospel worldwide. Let's speak them one by one. Number one, we're looking at deception by false prophets and false Christs. Deception by false prophets and false Christs. In Matthew chapter 24 again, reading from verses 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
here Jesus gave the very first sign. And he said, no, no, no doubt you've seen deception before in the world. Even as far back as the time of Moses, he talked about prophets and dreamers that will come to the children of Israel and will deceive them. False prophets have always been in the land. And also we know that at the time of Jeremiah, there were false prophets. In fact, some of the false prophets, they challenged his own prophecy. Do you remember the story of Ahab when he was to, to go to war? And all these prophets came together, deceiving him. They have always been there, and they are there in every age. But notice this, at the time when Christ is about to come, they will multiply in number. They will increase in their influence. And they will just be devastating and terrible in the power they are able to manifest. In fact, Jesus tells us further on in this chapter. In verses 23, 24, and 25. Verse 23, then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ. Or there, believe it not. He said, at that time, you will be hearing people, gullible people, vulnerable people. The people that have been brought into the net of deception, they will be telling you, here is Christ. Another one will say, no, he's over there. And the Lord Jesus said, believe it not. In verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Stop there for a moment. You see, the false prophets of past generations didn't have any, any power. Many of them couldn't show anything for their intimidating prophecies. But these prophets that will come at the end of the age, at the time when Christ is about to come, they will be so energized by demons and Satan himself, empowered by the powers of darkness that Jesus said they will show great signs, not ordinary signs, extraordinary signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, and the time is getting so near. And you are seeing false prophets rising up here and there. In verse 25, Jesus said, Behold, I have told you before, he said, if you are deceived, it's not going to be anybody's fault. I have told you before. And so you will see that it's going to be time of terrible deception. That's a parallel passage in Mark. Mark chapter 13. Mark recorded the same Oliver discourse. And uh, as you read the various parts of the records we have in the Gospels, you see shades of meaning. And you also see some things that were not written by one area or by one evangelist, written by another one. In Mark chapter 13 from verse 5. And Jesus answering began to say, Take it, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In verse 22. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, to deceive, to entice, to lead you away from sound doctrine, to make you shift your base, to make you doubt the authenticity of the word of God, or to make you feel maybe there is an alternative message and they will be affirming their false doctrine by their lying wonders. And so Jesus said, it will be to seduce. And then he said, if it were possible to seduce the very elect. Then he closes that section with a warning. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. He said, I have not left you in the dark. I have told you they are going to be deceivers. And I have told you they are going to multiply. And the intensity of their deceit is going to be compounded because of the miracles they'll be able to perform to affirm and confirm their error. In Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21 verse 8, And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name. They will not come in the name of Satan. 
they will not come in the name of uh, an idol. They will mention the name of Christ. And it is uh, very, very likely that they will be eloquent. It's very, very likely they will have studied the principles of communication. And they will be able to pass across their messages so very well and convincingly that the people will say, it seems believable. It seems these people are telling, they, they seem to be logical. And they seem to be able to attract men of position and men in politics and men in education. And people will say, could these be deceiving us? In fact, they'll get to the point in their deception. They would even say, I am Christ. And then in that verse 8, the Lord said, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. If it's a surprise to you that anything like that can happen, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Please remember, it's not everyone that carries the Bible that's a real Christian, a real follower of Christ. It's not everyone that names the name of Christ that actually belongs to Christ. It's not everyone that is saying, Thus says the Lord, that is sent by God. It's not everyone that is, you know, uh, saying, I am this, I qualified here, I qualified there, and I'm planting churches, I've helped many people, and I have this miracle power in my right and left hand, or in my leg, if I lay hands on you, fall on the ground. It's not every one of them that belongs to the Lord. And Jesus Christ said that the deception will be so terrible that many, many people will be deceived. And the epistle here is telling us that such, such people are false apostles, deceitful workers. In fact, they are transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Then the apostle tells us in the epistle, and no, Mabel, that's not a surprise. Are you surprised? No. Why should you be surprised? Here Moses came in the Old Testament and he said, Do you know the Lord has sent me? Let my people go. And then Pharaoh said, What sign are you giving me for that? Oh, he said, If you are looking for a sign, he threw his rod down and then he became a serpent. He picked it up again. He became a rod. Ah, uh, Pharaoh said, If that is what you are going to do, if you are going to go to the region of miracle signs and waters, wonders, wait, I am coming. He said, uh, Magicians, here we are. See the challenge this man, this Jewish fellow is giving us. Can you duplicate this kind of miracle? They say, no problem. And then they brought out their own rod. They threw it down. It became snakes, serpents as well. If you are looking for miracles, if it's only a miracle, you are making the yardstick and the measure that these people are the prophets of God, you are going to be deceived. That's why the apostle is telling us, he says, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. But here is their judgment, whose end shall be according to their works. And so the Lord Jesus Christ said that there will be deception. When it's coming, it's very, very near. Let's go to point number two, dissension among the nations. Dissension among the nations. Matthew chapter 24, we're not looking at verses 6 and 7. These are international disputes. I'm sure you know that uh, this world thought that they could bring this world to peace. At the end of the Second World War, the people of the world in the West in particular, they said there must not be any kind of worldwide devastation and terrible things like this anymore. There must be peace. And therefore they thought the thing to do to give us that kind of peace is to have a, the United Nations Organization. And they thought that if we will bring ourselves together and you have this country represented, this country represented, that one represented, and we sign all these treaties that we're not going to fight anymore, we're not going to kill one another anymore, we're not going to be behaving like brute animals anymore. 
destroying, devouring one another. They thought if we put that on paper, that that treaty will be able to keep us at peace. But since they signed all those treaties, and the United Nations came together to tell us now we're going to have peace, what do we find? We find basically the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus Christ. Because, you know, he said, heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will not pass away. And our world is burning. The world is dying. In Africa here, you've known about Liberia. You've known about Sierra Leone. You've known about uh, Zaire. You've known about South Africa. You've known about all the various countries. And when you go beyond uh, Africa, in the northern part of Africa, we've known about Sudan. You know, the killings and the wars and the things that are going on. Have you read about Bosnia? Have you read about Yugoslavia? Have you read of late of Russia? Have you read of late of all those other places where the wars are going on? The believers are not surprised when we read all those things and we hear them over the radio or we see them somewhere. We say, the timetable of the Lord is on target. The Lord is about to come. Here now we go to the second point, dissension among the nations, international disputes among those nations. Look at verses 6 and 7. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Then he says, see that ye be not troubled. If you are believers, you just know that your redemption is very near. The coming of the Lord is very near. You know, these are the signposts pointing to the very fact that that climactic event that we're expecting, that that event is about to take place. He said, you'll hear of wars, you'll hear of rumors of wars, see that she be not troubled, for all these things shall come, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Don't be fooled. He didn't say the rapture is not yet. That's not the rapture. He didn't say the second coming is not yet. He said the end, the final consummation, the final end of this age, of this dispensation, the final end of this world under the power of darkness is not yet because there are still a lot of events that are still going to take place even after you have been hearing of the wars and the rumors of wars. In verse 7, it said, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Let's stop there. That is telling us of the dissension or the disputes of the intertribal, international wars that uh, will be happening in various places. But Jesus wasn't the first to mention that. That had been mentioned in other parts of Scripture. In Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7, reading from verse 25. Ezekiel 7, 25 and 26. Destruction cometh. And it shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the Lord shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. That is, they will not know what to do. The wars, the rumors of wars, will destabilize the system of the world, and they'll be looking for the people to bring solution. They'll be looking for the counseling, for consultation, and a lot of things, and the more consultations and the things you are having, the more they will still not be able to find any solution. It's telling us that it's going to get worse before it becomes better. You see, there are people telling us things are going to become better. Things are going to change. In fact, there are people telling us there's going to be a worldwide revival. Well, the Bible is telling us here yeah, there will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. Things will get worse before they become better. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51, reading to you from verse 46. Unless your heart faints, and ye fear for the rumor that ye shall, that shall be heard in the land, a rumor shall both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumor, and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. How do you compare that to what Jesus said? Ruler against ruler, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation. Isaiah chapter 19. In Isaiah chapter 19, we're looking at verse 2. 
and I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. That's civil war. And they shall fight everyone against his brother, and everyone against his neighbor, and city against city. Here it comes, and kingdom against kingdom. So you will see that what Jesus said, it shouldn't have come to any Bible reader. Anyone that knew the Old Testament, it shouldn't have come to any of them by surprise. Because the Lord had said it will be so. Incidentally, after Jesus did this prophecy, he went to the cross and he died for our sins. And then he came after the resurrection, he showed himself by many infallible proofs to his own disciples, and the new death is key. And then he was about to go away. And when he was about to go away, they wanted to know now, from Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, they wanted to ask him a question. Because it was still on their mind. They still wanted to know about the coming kingdom. They were asking him in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Is it now? Are you going to reign now? Because you have died, you have risen from the dead, and we know that it is you, you are the risen glorified one. And then the Lord told them, there is still a time that they still need to wait until that that the Father had determined will be effected. In verse 7 he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But he shall receive power when the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. You get busy on evangelization. The timetable of the Lord will be taken care, by, taken care of by the Lord. And then, after some years, after the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, why will Jesus wait for the destruction of Jerusalem? before he will give the final revelation and prophecy. Well, in the Old Testament, the prophets gave two kinds of prophecies. The prophets gave prophecies that will be fulfilled in a few years. And the prophets also gave prophecies that will be fulfilled after many, many, many years. And how did the children of Israel know that the prophecies of the many years would be fulfilled? Very simple. They looked at the fulfillment of the prophecies that were nearby. If the prophet said, this will happen within a few weeks, within a few months, if it happens, then they will believe that what he said will happen many, many years to come, that those things will actually happen. Now think of Matthew chapter 24. You see, when Jesus gave the prophecies in Matthew chapter 24, he spoke about things yet to come for many, many years. But he also spoke about something that will be very near, that those who are listening to him will be able to tell that this is in fulfillment of the words of Jesus Christ. Let me remind you again. They were now sitting on the Mount of Olives. And now the disciples looking at the beautiful buildings of the temple. They came to show him, and they said, see these buildings. And then Jesus told them, you see all these buildings, not one stone will be left upon the other, every scene will be torn down. And then he gave other prophecies. Other prophecies he gave are for many, many, many years to come. But that one on the destruction of the temple was a nearby prophecy. A kind of prophecy that was fulfilled in the lifetime of the apostles. Because A.D. 70, General Titus from Rome, he came and he besieged Jerusalem. And in fact, uh, Josephus, the historian, uh, tells us that he stood in the middle of the place, that Titus, and he commanded his soldiers. He said, don't destroy it, don't destroy it. But the soldiers, and if you knew anything about the Roman soldiers, obedience was the order of the Roman soldiers. And the Roman soldiers were very, very strong. In fact, the Roman soldiers used to brag that no other nation will see the heels of uh, the Roman soldiers. What they meant by that is that they'll never run for you. They will trash everything and bring everything down. And they were really in charge of their armies. And General Titus said, don't touch the temple. He only wanted to destroy the city. But the soldiers, not knowing they were fulfilling the words of Jesus Christ against the command of their commander, 
they tore down every sin completely. Until Josephus tells us, if you went back after the destruction of the temple, you wouldn't know that there had been a building in that place before. They tore down everything completely. That tells you what Jesus said about the destruction of the temple, if it was fulfilled to the very letter, then he tells all the other things he said about the signs of his coming. All those things are going to be fulfilled, and it will be interesting for you to know this. That after Jesus gave all that prophecy, he died, he was buried, he rose again, then he showed himself to his disciples, then he ascended and went to heaven. Then, about 96 to 100 AD, he revealed himself to John, the beloved. And you know, he didn't change the prophecy. He was still telling John that when the seals are opened, when the veils are poured out, when the trumpets are sounded, that all these things he said in Matthew chapter 24, that those things are going to come to pass. I want you to verify that in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Reading to you from verse 2 all through to verse 4. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Do you understand that? It means that over here there is a fellow on a white horse. You see, it is Christ that should be riding on the white horse. Because white symbolizes purity. But here is a deceiver that is riding also on a white horse. Here is the false Christ we're talking about. Here is the false prophet we're talking about. In fact, the culmination of it will be the Antichrist. And he sat on, on, the, on that horse with a bow, without an arrow. To, me, to tell you that, you'll be thinking, there is no danger. He doesn't have any arrow in his bow, and he's not going to do anything destructive or devastating. It's the deception that Jesus spoke about. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth without any arrow, conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, the second living creature say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Wars and rumors of wars, nation fighting against nation, kingdom against kingdom, no peace on the earth. And they shall, and that they should kill one another. Wars and rumors of wars. And there was given unto him a great sword. Well, you can see very clearly. That what Jesus Christ said about the signs preceding a second coming. That already you can see the you can see it is coming. And you can see these things that are being fulfilled. And when it is very, very, very near, you will see it will be coming in rapid succession. Let's go to point number three. Devastation throughout the world. Devastation throughout the world. Not just in Israel. Not just in the old Roman Empire, but devastation throughout the world. We are back in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, the latter part of verse 7, from, uh, it says, And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Let me uh, show you the interpretation of that verse 8 before I go back to verse 7. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. If you knew Greek and you studied the Greek, the word translated sorrow here actually means the labor pains that a pregnant woman goes through when a child is about to be born. And Jesus said, when you see all these things taking place, the deception and the dissension, and the devastation, and the destruction, and all the things that will be taking place, you will know that these are the very beginnings of birth pains. Now let me ask you a question. When do pregnant women have labor pains? Is it at the beginning of the pregnancy? No. Is it in the middle of the pregnancy? No. It is at the end of the pregnancy. When the child is about to be born, then you have the pains coming. And if you know anything about labor pains, 
when that child is about to be born, the labor pains will come suddenly, grip the woman, and then the woman is released. After a period of time again, maybe many minutes, the pain will come again and grip her and release her. At the beginning of the pain, so it will be coming gradually, spaced from one another. And you see, the Jewish people of the day, they didn't know anything about anesthetics. They didn't know anything you can do to pregnant women to lessen the pain. You know, Jesus was talking to the people that didn't live at our scientific age when the pregnant woman, if he wanted to, could avoid the pain. He was talking to these people from rural areas that they knew how the pains will come and then it will be spaced. But when the, a child is just about to be born, the pains will come more rapidly. Am I right? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, when I am about to come. You're asking for the signs? The signs of my return. The signs of my coming back. He said, you will find out something. Things will be happening. There will be the beginning of birth pains. They will come and they will be spaced but when the coming is very, very near, like the birth of the child is very, very near, it will become in a rapid fire succession. Now, that's what we have discovered. If you look at uh, these uh, verses, it's talking about famines. You know, in the past, we used to hear, you know, geographers will tell you there was a drought in this part of the land. And then maybe after about 10 years, there will be drought in another part of the land. And then we'll be trying to have AIDS, that is relief AIDS, to help that area. Because we've not done that for the past 10 years. It happened so many years ago. But nowadays, you know what is happening? It's coming in rapid fire succession. You hear there's drought here. In another few months, there's drought here. In another few months, there's drought here. This thing is about to happen. The birth pains are already coming. You hear about earthquakes. Geographers will tell you that if you pick all the earthquakes of uh, maybe a hundred years altogether, or even a thousand years before the few years have uh, passed, before the past 20, 30, 50 years, you will discover that all the earthquakes of the 1,000 years past, uh, they are not up to the earthquakes that are happening even in our own day. The earthquakes are now becoming more rapid. They happen here, they happen there, and they are not just happening in places where uh, you think that is the third world. Uh, those people, maybe they didn't understand, they didn't have the instruments that will tell them the earthquake is coming. And to be able to build buildings that will withstand the shock or the quaking of the earth, it's happening also in the west. And Jesus said, when you see all these things happening, and they are coming rapidly, 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 you know that the time is at hand the devastation that will be happening throughout the world. In fact, Luke puts it this way. Why don't you look at it in, Matt, in Luke chapter 21 and see the descriptive manner in which Luke records it. Luke chapter 21, in verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Uh, it's not just what the geographers and ecological people and the people that are studying our environment, not just what they're telling us, that maybe the world is not able to support its population now, or because of this, or because it's more than that. It's telling us these shall be things determined, decided from heaven, and they'll be coming from heaven. In verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and men's heart failing them for fear. That means men will just be dropping dead when they hear the news, when they see the signs, the shock of what they see that they never thought could happen in the civilized world. They will be so short, they just stop breathing. Men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. In Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21. For thus says the Lord God, how much more 
when I sent my four judgments upon Jerusalem. The sword war. The famine, you heard that in Matthew. The noisome beast and the pestilence to cut off from each man and beast. So then you see that there will be this kind of worldwide devastation. And remember, these are the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not an ordinary mortal man only depending on revelation. This is revelation personified. This is the truth himself. And this is the word personified. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. It is this word that became flesh that is now telling us this is what will be. This is the very prophet, the greatest of all prophets, that knows the past and the present and the future, telling us that these are the things our world should be expecting when it comes near to the time when Christ will come again. Number four, the destruction of life, torture and persecution. Destruction of life, torture and persecution. In Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 from verse 9 and verse 10, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. There you see persecution, you see torture. You see, destruction of life. This is severe persecution of believers by the evil, ungodly world. More than ever before in history, the people who will want to remain with the Lord at the time when it is near the coming of the Lord, they will face terrible persecution of great intensity. And you can tell after the church has been raptured, after the church has been taken away, and you have the marriage supper of the Lamb up on high, there will be the great tribulation here in the world. And all these things we're talking about will great, greatly multiply in intensity. Well, because of our time, let's go to the next point, which is point number five, deflection from Christ by many backsliders. Matthew chapter 24, from verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. That is why this church ought to watch very carefully. It is more difficult now than 20 years ago. There are lots of false prophets now than 30, 50 years ago. And the Christians of today have to be all eyes and all intelligence and you have to have revelation of the word of God. If not, the deception that is in the land can sweep you off your ground. Because even the very elect, if it were possible, they'll be deceived. And you see that all these other signs, you see them coming in rapid succession. And you know that this deception, the Lord mentioned it again. And then he said, because iniquity shall abound. Don't you see iniquity abounding today? There were things that you could never think of in Africa before. And many of those things are happening now. Terrible immorality happening today. And even you will see some people that call themselves church. And in those uh, churches, you have immorality in the open. And you will see the terrible, terrible things that are taking place. That is to tell you that things are getting worse and it's not going to become better. And sometimes I find some uh, Christians, so-called Christians, they do not understand the word of God. You see that occultism is, is in that assembly. You see that Satan worship is in that assembly. Immorality is in the open in that assembly. And they condone and they pet the sinners and the backsliders. They pet them at the back. They say, well, it doesn't matter. We have love here. We don't want to be so overbearing on people to discipline them. Then you find a Christian going to such an assembly. And you say... Christian, why are you in that kind of assembly? What are you doing there? Don't you love your soul? Don't you know that it's a dangerous place for you? Oh, he says, you know, I am here. Not that I want to take part in the immorality. I am going to change that place. That place may change that fellow before long. 
because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. And many of us here were pastors. Many of us here were ministers. You know the pressure that comes upon us sometimes from some members in our churches. And they will say, well, pastor, they're doing this in the other church. They're doing that in the other church. They allow this, they, they allow this and they allow that in the other church. Why doesn't our church lower it a little, go slow a little bit, and uh, make these things easier for the people so that our members will not run to the other church? In fact, so that the other people will come to us. That's exactly what Jesus said. Iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. If there is any time we need to be steadfast in Christian doctrine of holiness, it is today. Because anywhere you go, whether America or Europe or to, the, uh, to CIS, or you are going to Latin America or you come to Africa, uh, immorality is the order of the day. Over the television and over the, in the theater, in the films, in the pornographic things they are showing. If you do not take your stand, the thing will just sweep you away. Because we're living at a time, we're living in a day, when if you are not very careful, the thing will sweep you off your ground, and you will not be able to endure to the end. I pray you'll endure to the end. Because, you know, in verse 13, Jesus said, And he that shall endure unto the end, endure unto the end, you know, sometimes uh, uh, when you see some believers, uh, they have a little problem, a little delay in getting a child, a little delay in getting married, a little delay in getting a job, a little problem here, a little problem there. And they say, well, I cannot wait anymore. If uh, all the little, little things happening today, if they take you by surprise, if they sweep you away, what are you going to do when the restraining force the Holy Ghost is no more restraining the immorality of the world when the, when the system will totally break loose and all the evil things and the corrupt things will come into the open without any check. What are you going to do at that time? If at this time now, when you still have some people that will feel ashamed for doing that, feel ashamed for being um, naked in the public, although there are societies even now where people will come out almost naked in the, in the public, and there are some churches that will say, allow these people to wear whatever they want to wear. They don't uh, bring rules and regulations here. Let the people come and worship. Worship in immorality. Worship in sin. Worship in the death and the pollution that you have over there in the world. If the church is going to be the church, keep all the influences of Satan outside the church. And let the church be pure. Let the church be holy. And let us know that we are preparing for the coming of the Lord. It's my decision by the grace of God, whatever the people of the world do, whatever all the other churches are doing, I want to stand on this Bible till the end. I'm sure that is the thing in your own heart. Because, you know, many people are going to backslide. They're going to deflate. They're going to go away from the Lord. They're going to deny the Lord. But he that shall endure unto the end. Will you endure? I said, will you endure? Your eyes will see many things. And in fact, there are times in the world in which we are living now, you will need to close your eyes so that those things don't enter into your heart. Your ears will hear many things. And in fact, there are times in our own day, in our own age, when you have to shut your ears but so that you don't hear what is coming from the waves of the world. So that by the grace of God, you will put your body under so that after you have preached to other people, you yourself will not become a cast away. I come to the last point, which is the declaration of the gospel in verse 14. And this gospel, stop there. This gospel, not a modern day gospel, not adulterated gospel, not a gospel that cannot bring conviction to the sinners. This gospel, the same gospel that Jesus preached, the same gospel that the apostles preached, the same gospel that Paul emphasized. The same gospel of the New Testament. This gospel, there is no other saving gospel. You, you hear of gospels preached that will not emphasize repentance or restitution or faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The kind of gospel they are preaching nowadays that will not transform any life, not change any life. If any man be in Christ, my Bible says his watch is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold all things have become new. And you know, in our world today, you'll find a man that is smoking his pipe and smoking his cigarette. 
you try to give him a try to be born again. Oh, he says, young man, thank you very much for your love. I'm born again already. How about this smoke coming out of your mouth? Oh, well, that's my mouth. My heart is born again. And sometimes you see people that are drunk and they, they are staggering under the influence of alcohol and you want to help them. You say, gentleman, can I give you this tract for you? To, oh, he says, uh, what is that? And you say, it is talking about the atonement of Christ to be born again. Oh, he says, are you born again? You say, yes, by the grace. He says, praise the Lord, I'm like you. No, you are not like me. He says, I'm born again too. He is drunk, he's also born again. Do you know you have some people that are practicing homosexuality? And then you want to tell them that because of all these things, the wrath of God, the judgment of God is coming upon the world. And you're trying to tell them to know the gospel, to know the Lord. And they say, oh, well, I'm, I'm a Christian too, only that you follow a lifestyle that looks regular, man and woman, husband and wife. I follow the gay lifestyle. They call it gay. But it is sin. It is evil. They tell us they are born again. And you sometimes you get people that are fraudulent, you get people that are changing accounts, you get people that are doing a lot of atrocious things. If you ask them about being born again, oh, they say, praise, praise, praise the Lord, I am born again. They even say they are charismatic. Others are Pentecostal. And then they say, if you don't believe I'm born again, can I speak in tongues for you? And they begin to blow the speaking in tongues out. To him, he thinks that that speaking in tongues, he has now arrived. But he's still living in sin. This gospel. Don't change it. You go to your country or you are coming from your country, preach the same gospel. You know, if it is the same gospel, anywhere you go, whether you are in Nigeria or Ghana or Zambia or South Africa or Malawi or Zimbabwe, it will be this gospel. Praise the Lord. So the people that are telling us that, you know, this is our own country here and we have our own interpretation of the gospel. That's false. That will not save any soul. The gospel that will save. And the gospel that Jesus wants to be preached in all the world to the end of time is the same gospel. It says in verse 14, the declaration of the gospel throughout the world. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Wait a minute. Jesus said, there will be nation fighting against nation. There shall be kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famine. There shall be pestilences. There will be earthquakes in many places. Doesn't that stop missionary work? Doesn't that stop evangelization? If I hear there are troubles going on here and there and there, doesn't that stop the work of preaching the gospel? If I know that the economy of Zaire has totally calmed down and crumbled and people can hardly feed themselves, should we send a missionary again to, uh, to Zaire? If I know that things are very difficult in Sudan, if I know that Algeria, that they're difficult against the Christians, should we ever think of sending missionaries there? Jesus said, in the midst of the wars, in the midst of the rumor, in the, in the midst of the pestilence, in the midst of all the problems, this gospel of the kingdom will continue to be preached in all the world for a witness unto how many nations? I said how many nations? All nations, and then at the final end shall the consummation of all things, the end come. When the Lord will come, where will he meet you? What will you be doing? What is the emphasis of your life? Is it eat and drink for tomorrow we may die? Or are you preaching the same gospel? Are you blown away by the deception? Are you uh, surprised by the dissension? Are you thinking of the devastation in all the world and therefore you are pulling back? You cannot go to that village, you cannot go to that town, you cannot go to that nation, you cannot do the work of the Lord? Or are you saying, whoever backslides, whoever goes away from the Lord or from the church, I am going to remain at my post until I hear the trumpet sound. There's only one thing I'm looking for. That by the grace of God, in a twinkling of an eye, as our children sang to us, when the trumpet shall sound, I believe by the grace of God, you will hear the sound of that trumpet. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we which are alive, alive in Christ, alive in the Lord, alive still on the face of the earth at, the, at that time, we shall be changed. And then we shall be taken up. There will be the rapture of the saints. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, 
and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we, 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 the people of God, those who are living righteously, those who are waiting for the Lord's return, we, those who by the grace of God are holy, because it says, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible body, the body that can get sick, the body that can die, the body that is feeling pain now, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, we give it us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable always, abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Rise up and pray and get ready. Get ready, the Lord is coming. He has shown us the signs of his coming. Where will you be? Where will you be? Where will you be at that time? When the Lord shall come. Don't be among the backsliders. Don't be among the unstable. Don't be among the people that are not serious with their Christianity. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Be ready for the time. And while you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, keep on preaching the gospel. This gospel. No other gospel. Not a watered down gospel. Not an adulterated gospel. Not a kind of gospel that is excusing sin. Condoning sin. How is it in your own life? How is it in your own life? Are you getting ready for the coming of the Lord? If he will come anytime. Anytime. Suddenly. 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 Will he appear? Don't allow the temptation of the day to pull you away. Don't allow the poverty of the time to discourage you. Don't allow the hatred of unbelievers around you to sidetrack you. Take your stand for the Lord. Take your stand for the Lord. Endure. Persevere. Remain with the Lord and keep on preaching the gospel. Keep on preaching the gospel. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for the witness in all nations before the end will come. How faithful are you to this gospel? How faithful are you giving all your time, all your energy, all your resources, releasing your wife to preach the gospel, releasing your children to preach the gospel, releasing your husband to preach the gospel. Pastors, releasing your members to preach the gospel. Not sitting on them, sitting on the position, and not allowing other people to do it. Are you getting prepared for the coming of the Lord? We have seen these signs that Jesus spoke about. They are prevalent now in our day. More than ever.